When government representatives are lobbied by the, uh, by the rich individuals, when the votes are controlled by the rich, we tell you, Judge, this isn't proper democracy. We tell you that giving the voice to the people without any manipulation or control from the rich individuals that might lobby these represent representatives or political parties are what true democracy looks like. That is what referendum is able to push, and this is what proposition is able to push in the true principle of democracy. Before moving on, Two layers of framing here, and then one preemption. First layer of framing is that how will this major government policy actually look like, right? This would mean they'd be the online voting or forums. It'd be efficient forums, putting out like putting out these type of ballots, being able to vote, being giving you information on what this actually policy looks like and what it is that they're trying to pass. And these in established democracies are most liberal Western democ uh, democratic countries, for example, like the United States. And it's fair to say that this process will be carried out efficiently and effectively, right? So what are the major government policy decisions, right? These are policies that affect all individuals, or at least in most individuals at the very least. Like major examples of this is like healthcare decisions, let's say like COVID or social security, infrastructure projects, or the decisions that depend on the people greatly, right? Like constitutional amendments. But before moving on, one preemption. The first preemption, the one preemption is that Opposition might come up here to say that citizens don't always know what's best for the country. Two responses to this. First of all, is to say that, but it's a most likely all major government policy decisions are something that all people know about, regardless of what your social status is. It's something that impacts almost everybody, meaning that you have at least the slightest amount of knowledge, right? Most people will know what social security is. Most people will know you what are. healthcare is. Most people will understand these type of things. And so moving before moving on to those arguments that POI. Your case premises on high participation rates and referendums for everyone's voices to be properly heard. How do you guarantee high voting turnouts in your world frequent referendums? I think I'm going to explain this more in my argument, but to give a brief response, now individuals understand that their voice, they have a power in voice, right? They don't need to be in a representative where they don't actually give their major opinion. What does this mean? This means that individuals will be more willing to vote because they understand their vote matters, right? Because they understand that it's not being manipulated by government representatives that don't actually follow their motivations because they're just lobbied by rich individuals and the political party that are funded by these rich individuals, right? So this means that participation is ever more higher on our side than ever before on the on the opposition side. But before but moving on to my first argument on the principle of democracy, right? What is the premise of this? Equal representation is now available in all areas, right? How is this true? Two layers to this. First of all, there is no problem regarding legitimacy or fairness since the people themselves get to choose the outcome. What does this mean? There's no manipulation from rich because all the individual is doing is going online and do directly voting on these forums. Let's say you're going on their phone and directly voting, understanding these things, right? This means that there's no manipulation that can possibly be involved. Second is that demo demo cost, democracy exists this comparatively much more prevalent when every single citizen can participate as a representative, right? In the past, if we were to look at status quo, representative democracies are representative of some, a certain group, right? But this doesn't always mean that it's realistically showing all the uh, all the opinions of every citizen in that area. It could just be 51%, right? This means that that 49% is not inclined to, let's say, vote right now in the political election. Compared to now, if we were to say 100% oh, of it all can be represented, then those individuals would be much more willing to go and actually vote for these type of things, right? So what is the purpose of democracy? How It's about how well the people's voices can get into parliament, right? Democracy is the government of the people. And assuming both sides are comparative in a democracy, it's just a representation versus a direct one, right? If citizens' voices are directly headed towards policies, it's much more likely Likely that there's correct representation compared to a representation of a certain area that might even if it was to say that government lobbying does not work only requires 51 percent of actual agreement of most opinions right you are people that are the most affected by this in different policies that governments can pass, right? It makes sense that it is the people that choose what major policies pass or not because they are going to be the ones that are affected the most by this, right? Why does represent democracy fail at actually doing this, right? Three layers to this. First of all, about efficiency. As politicians, you are forced to negotiate and fight over decisions, right? Most decisions end up in a deadlock, right? If you need to use voting, it's so much more simple and so much more effective as citizens can just vote on what their honest intent is and what's best for them, right? Compared to, let's say, if we look at even status quo in the United States, the, Demo the Democrats and the Republicans are almost in a constant deadlock in Congress. You are. Disagree and are a complete bipolar and an agenda in what they do, right? The second point is that how political parties help represent representatives as, as since many of them are all lobbied by the rich individuals, right? What does this mean? Since all political parties are helping representatives, the representatives are paid and under, are funded to know what the rich people want and are going to most likely want to do what they want for the rich for the rich and what they want for the actual party, right? That being said, that means that representatives, even if their own political party, even if they say they were representing a minority group, most likely would not happen because they'd be lobbying all over these. And the third layer to this is that those individuals who don't agree with this, the two bipolarized parties, they're no longer able to why do representative democracies actually fail at doing this, right? Three layers to this. First is efficiency. As politicians, you are forced you are. to 
okay, and fight over these decisions. Most decisions end up in a deadlock because, first of all, these political parties, like the, let's say the United States, the Republicans and the Democrats are always just going to vote against each other, meaning that it's not going to happen comparatively on our side, where voting is so much more simple and citizens are just able to be honest intent on what they actually want to vote on. A vote on. Two, political parties help representation, as since many of them are lobbied by the rich individuals, meaning that the represent, repre representatives, most likely that are funded by political parties, are now paid to do and are incentivized to do what the rich people want for these parties, right? Third is that individuals who don't agree with these two bipolarized political parties are able to voice their opinion. Now, this is what we mentioned about the voting amount of people that are actually able to vote because these third parties weren't that really impactful and there was enough representatives to actually voice their opinions but now they do right more on this later but the second argument the second argument how benefits the most vulnerable stakeholders what is the premise of this argument most individuals of countries are either mostly lower or middle class this means that the policies that are geared towards helping the development areas of low and middle class are much more likely to happen why is this true just by the numbers there are more middle class individuals than highly class individuals in any type of democracy additionally any policy that might not even impact the rich but gives societal and socioeconomic benefits will get more support and garner more votes, meaning that this policy has a better chance of even being moved over and the government can't do anything about lobbying because everyone has their own individual votes and we clearly proved these in the first argument, right? It's the comparative that high rich class individuals take most voting power, meaning that they can currently strive to do whatever they want, right? Even without the lobbying in so far as the rich 0.1 elite control probably basically 60 percent of most global world capitals party without even lobbying have an incentive to invest in their policies that benefit the rich because they know that has the most payout and they know that that's going to be what supports the most right this means that on our side we impact because we help the most vulnerable stakeholder being able to give proper representation and we most likely going to have better policies that are geared toward this and even if there isn't as many policies to this at least those policies will pass because there's no longer lobbying there's no longer false representation no manipulation because individuals are able to honestly vote on what they want, the numbers will not be different. And the numbers are clearly true that say the lower and middle class are basically bigger than the majority. Judge, we have proven to you that not only are we representation of democracies failed because of the lobbying current status quo, but we've helped the most vulnerable stakeholders in this debate for those reasons we are very proud to propose. Just straight in, in my speech, first I'll move on to some points of framing and then rebut the previous speaker and then move on to arguments. First, two arguments on first about for about efficiency and about the representation. So first, let's move on to some points of framing here. The motion clearly sets the context of the debate of an established democracy. This is to say that this debate in the, is in the context of places like the USA, South Korea, the possibility of corruption or other issues is, is largely minimal, which directly engages population's main, main point on political lobbying. But we assume that all procedures of electing representatives or voting referendums will be done in a fair process for a fair, for a fair debating round. But what does the uh, process of referendums really look like? Like other major elections, like presidential elections, to guarantee the fair process, there has to be voting sites in every town for equality, commits to prevent corruption, and a time in which all citizens are available to fairly vote. So even if proposition has the fiat to say that referendums exist, it will be troublesome to test to even hold ones. But how do we define major government policy decisions? These are decisions that impact most of the citizens' lives. For example, economic decisions that Congress sets for the Federal Reserve, welfare policies, pensions, on captures, etc. And we agree basically with proposition's framing here. Proposition cannot scrim through this debate by limiting the extent of major government policies. The motion is clear when it says all major government policies decision, decisions should be through a referendum. But what is our counterfactual? We prefer sticking to representative democracy where elected officials, such as congressmen, make the decision on the behalf of their citizens, just like the status quo, i.e. in the direct democracy. We would also like, like to add that if there is a situation where knowing the public opinion is necessary, we'll have plebiscites rather than referendums, which is a non-binding referendum. This gives us a bundle plus one of recognizing public opinion while the government makes autonomous decisions undisturbed by populism or other potential threats referendum posts. This is possible because this was used in Greece, for example, to decide if the nation should decide to take the EU's funds. But still, there will be rare, they will, this will be rare, and for the most case, we support representative democracy. What is the metric of this debate? Given that proposition highly emphasizes democracy, we want to be charitable and debate on the basis of democracy, which is the proper which is proper representation. This premise is on the fact that one, all citizens' voices are heard, and two, everyone can make a well-informed decision. We will prove that both these premises of democracy cannot be met under proposition's world, with referendum through an, through an argument on the harms of to the minorities and another argument on efficiency. Before that, rebuttals. Two things here. First, they gave us this one-liner, and their actual whole case literally relies on political lobbying for the one-person rich minority. So I think this is largely mitigatory, mitigatory but two responses here. First, it's not likely that it's, it's a majority because the because as the majority is the will win, and that and like we think that the power that proposition talks about is like about the majority, is only the minority. I is the only minority because not so many people can actually afford to like political lobby and spend millions of dollars to like po the politicians and to note that in a representative democracy already the majority have the voice. So I don't really understand why why a referendum is necessary. But even if we accept that there is pol political lobbying, we think 
that our policy of plebiscite actually deals with this because citizens still get a voice on our side of the house. And despite lobbying, politicians still have an incentive to better the society for all in order to be reelected in the next election. Which is, and also many established democracies prohibit lobbying, like the US allows, but South Korea does not. So if pop mm-hmm. hinges their case on the US's lobbying, their case is very narrow and limiting. But two, on a high election rate, even if presidential elections have low voting rates, why will still people, why will people still like vote, why will people keep voting when the votes are not even impactful than a presidential election? Because simply because people will go and vote, people simply because people will go and vote doesn't mean that their decisions will be in a well informed one. We say otherwise, we will prove so later in our argument. Before I move on, POI, yes. In democratic governments like the US, what choices of political parties do you have other than the Democrats and the Republicans? Right, I, I go more to this in my second argument, but there's a, most legislators are done by a PR or SMD system. So it's so in most cases, even if it is a minority party, minority parties like the Green Party still get a voice, and the Democrats and Republicans represents the majority of people's opinion. So and or they at least have the incentive to do so. And with that, I'll move on to my first argument on the harms of minorities here and on populism. The premise is that when all major pol- policy de- decisions are referenced, the vo- voice of a minority is neglected. Why is this so? Two layers of analysis. I'll, I'll also integrate a lot of my rebuttals here. But first, mid- what does a majority rule system look like? Referendums, like any other election system, runs under a majority rule system. This is to say that no matter what, getting the majority of votes is most crucial. This leads to a problem of populism, which commonly occurs in democratic nations, where politicians try to apply only the majority. But at least for representative democracies, as the terms of the office is typically four to five years once elected, these officials can still to what they think is best for the country and show the results of their work in that four or five years. But note that too, people are less interested in politics. Like there are people that are less interested in politics or simply don't have the time to learn, devote their like time into like learning politics and there's and are likely to vote without much thought, i.e. uninformed votes. The harm here is two points. First, it is likely that important policies, like when people vote for important policy, people will vote for what is only best for them. Proposition that cannot say this is the essence of democracy and that, say that it is therefore justified because A, it leads to government policies that can actually harm the country, no, I... country i.e. Brooks to succeed because UK citizens voted thinking only, of, only about the EU's immigration policies and completely neglected the trade benefits and economic benefits with the policy the EU, EU membership route, but this is the exact reason why UK citizens today largely, largely view Brexit as a failure, but to at least to, to overall less rationale and thought out policy since the citizens are likely to only think about what they want. I, it's a fact that many developed countries affect, accept many refugees from conflict within regions like Russia, like Ukraine, and the, that the refugees rely on the ability to immigrate to these countries that can support them and allow them to have new life. The issue with this is that the domestic citizens are likely to not want immigrants, as seen with the USA, because it drains federal taxes that could have been used on US citizens in this careful world for whatnot. If this kind of majority government policy was decided by a referendum, it is extremely likely that immigrants will be largely limited to end developed countries as it's absolutely essential for them to survive. But two, there's an inability for poor people to properly participate. Compared to those of the middle class or the rich, the poor people simply do not have enough time to watch news and engage themselves in social movements to dive deep into politics. And at the same time, they need to care for like their family and work. On the other hand, the wealthy have more times and they can vote with the knowledge of the few situ- situation. The impact here is that rich or middle class have a clear advantage because they can really understand the policies and recognize what policies are best for them and give over policies that benefit them the most. Uh, it is likely that the wealthier middle class will want more economic policies rather than policies of increasing social welfare, further marginalizing the poor. But, they, but to the minority, i.e. the vulnerable people like poor people or sexual or like religious minorities don't get a voice because they're a minority. And as Kevin says to himself, only the largest group of people can get a voice. But responding to Kevin's point on like how there is somehow more voice for middle class, I think we, I think that that is symmetrical in an under, indirect democracy because of presidential elect- elections, polarity and whatnot. But next to on efficiency here, we think that an urgent situation, it takes time and representative democracies is easier. So going back to the time when we had COVID and what if the government decided that the mandatory vaccines would be a referendum, so the once the referendum is being the virus would be spreading, harming the safety and health of our citizens, representative democracy likely have a faster and more efficient way of deciding because in the case of an urgent issue, since the government officials know what is best for the country and can decide unilaterally rather than trying to think of everyone's opinion. But therefore, we think that, that there's, a effic- there's a lack of efficiency that could be um, largely harmful in urgent situations under referendums. So proud to pro- oppose. When is my needs going to be reflected in government policies? That is a question electorates and the people ask their needs when their needs are largely inaccurately represented and feel that their confidence as voters and feel that their like importance and significance as voters in a democratic system are at its lowest. I'm going to talk about two things in my speech. First of all, I want to talk about the quality of democracy as to why on the comparative are we getting better. But second, I want to talk about people on the individual level as to what type of treatment that they should be getting in a high level 
of a democracy, like in this motion sense, right? Then of course, I want to talk about some clarifications on their counterfactual, right? What was their counterfactual? Their says counterfactual is basically representative democracy. And basically, I'm going to give you, let's take a preview as to why I'm going to say representative democracy really doesn't work. Because on the comparative principally, it is the people that are affected by policies passed by governments the most. It is intuitively the most accurate reflection of whether if people want to pass possible passive uh, policy or not like you can literally see in a statistical manner as well but on an intuitive man manner as well that epistemically if you see something you can see oh whether if this person whether if this group of person like people really don't want this policy to be passed for example it, it, it can look like whether it's like the marginalized groups of people or let's say the middle class who are the who constitute the most amount of people in a population or in a nation even in developed nations even in developed nation as well like you can clearly see what type of policies they accept what type of policies they don't accept i think this has no problems inherently, but also I'm, I'm going to preview as to why I'm going to talk about efficiency and how efficiency is much more better in our side of the house as to why direct democrat direct democracies are much better. But third, I'm going to talk about why lobbying is largely going to affect the process of representative democracy, thus making it fail. But first of all, I'm going to talk about quality of democracy. Like, what did they say? They say that there's going to be a, a, a they said that like direct dem democracy is going to be affected by the majority like case, and that some people may not get the votes in. With, and whatnot. But first of all, this argument fails on the comparative because of two layers. First of all, if representative democracies are prone to lobbying, which should give you a host of analysis on, like direct democracies or referendums are much less considered of power itself, like about more over the quantity, right? Like intuitively in a population, the group that constitutes the most are the marginalized, the middle and lower class individual. Even in the developed nations, it's really the top that dominates the population. What does this mean? Like we told you that if representatives and yeah. like obviously these types of politicians get meddled in with the process where people should be the ones that's making the vote, we told you that a lot of lobbying can happen from the rich to benefit them. All those policies to benefit them, right? I think what we told you in the first I'm going to then touch upon more as to why representative democracies failed at doing this. This was major yeah. a lot of the analysis in a moment that came out in the first argument. I think this was a largely missed by Annie because we told you as to the reason why the representative democracies failed in the long run was that political parties would help representatives because many are all lobbied by rich individuals, which obviously means that all the representatives will be paid to what the rich people wanted for their party. That being said, representative, even if the political party isn't true, like it's obviously going to be affected by the rich in some areas and in some instances. That's why our side told you as to why direct democracies are not only just first of all in efficiency much more better because you get to listen to what the people who are affected by most by the policies that are to be passed are going to be affected by but also second of all as to why direct democracies are not prone to like lobbying from a lot of these people is because of direct people that are voting for this. Like what is the like rich people going to do? Like lobby the people that are voting? Like that's not going to happen. But also then they talk about basically like they then talk Talk about um how like obviously they like, talk about referendum is not going is going to get paid by corruption. But we tell you in response is that if the representatives are not making the votes, then it means that the lobbying needs to go to literal people in the country, and that is very unlikely, as we just told you. But with Elo, there's one liner response just saying, "Oh, majority works with like representative democracies." Uh, but like obviously, like there is no mechanism, no examples, because our first argument literally says that lobbying is highly prevalent in like uh, like alongside our second argument, right? We told you that the rich will lobby and another response to this was that rich really don't have enough money. Judge, they inherently do and the top 1% will have enough to do this. And but obviously this is the reason why even if they're the top 1% in terms of quantity, they're literally the ones that control most of the things, including political parties right now. But also then, and uh, before I move on to my point on like uh, people ordering EPOIs. Policy decisions require comprehensive understanding of the policy's implementation, impacts, and many other factors. How can the poor and marginalized people who are busy earning a living make a well-informed decision based on things like research? The poor not knowing, the people not knowing, people not caring is much more likely to happen on your side because it's an innate tendency and the inherent nature of these types of direct democracies that push you and to tell you individual people that whatever you are, whatever condition you are in, you are part of the votes. You are important in the decision-making process and your vote counts in these types of complex issues. We tell you that this is not a problem if these types of people are educated to some extent. Even if you're poor because you're these types of universal healthcare, these types of all these types of uh, like measures still affect you 
these poor people are still not going to care. But we told you in another layer in the second argument or even in the first argument as to why those individuals would still care, right? We told you that representative democracy nowadays is the, like basically has low voting rates, right? Like many citizens simply isolate themselves from politics in general because they believe that they really can't do anything to change the outcome of politics. But that's not the message that our side gives to these types of voters. Our side tells you on the second layer on people that when their side comes up and tells you that representation and that poor people aren't affected by policies, they aren't like to care and their ideas aren't likely to pass through. We told you that it's not people to tell these types of middle class people that it's not that you are part of this but this It's up to the uh, officials to decide on these matters and uh, how obviously it's up to these officials to uh, make these matters, right? But we told you that this wasn't true. And because of, on this basis, we're very proud uh, to uh, propose. Judge, imagine that we had a referendum and one side there were 50 votes and the other side there were 49. In their side, the 50 vote will win, even if the difference is only one vote. This is the clear um, status quo of the majority rule system, that the minority gets silenced, their opinion don't matter. These kinds of discussions and um, these kinds of discussions that happen in parliament actually doesn't exist anymore, which is crucial harm on their side that they didn't rebut anymore. We believe this is a reason why even on our side, we have a small minority of lobbying when not, we would actually take care of the minority's voice and which is the reason we're so proud to um, oppose. Now, moving on to some uh, rebuttals. On their point about lobbying, we basically told you that their whole case is, is contingent on the harm of representative democracy, which is lobbying. But we basically gave you two responses. First, it's not the major majority because the rich is not even like 1% of the world. But secondly, we gave the idea of plebiscites, right? If there are big enough national factors on our side, we will still have plebiscites, which are like voting for a change in the constitution and whatnot, right? They are not the only ones who have the citizens' voice. We have it too, right? I'll take it later. Thirdly, this is unique. Lobbying is illegal in the status quo. And it's socially condemned in um, in South Korea, right? When these when these rich individuals who usually own like companies and corporations and are CEOs, right? They usually have these kinds of image to obtain for their like kind of um, companies, right? And, and looking at the status quo, the, the cancel culture is uprising. People are very woke and they boycott companies if, if they feel like they're corrupt, right? Why would these big corporation owners who are rich not care about the public's idea and how they view people and uh, like uh, jeopardize their like profit for just because of the fact they care about politics, right? We believe that the, since these rich care about their image, the percentage of lobbying actually decreases on our, uh, on our side, right? We believe this lobbying is not big of a harm in representative democracy, right? Second point, they talk about high particip participation. But first, we our cl speaker clearly talked about how presidential elections in the status quo are up to 50 and 60%. This is very low, right? And their uh, policy, the only thing they say is, oh, we will give out flowers, uh, fly flyers, and we will do like campaigns and whatnot. But speaker, that is done in the status quo. And still, people do not vote for presidents, right? If these kinds of presidential elections are big enough and people understand the importance, why would people not vote for it, right? They say people understand the impacts of their actions on like their side, but like these kinds of status, uh, even if these kinds of like status quo government um, policies are not working out, why would why on their side people will be more motivated to do this? They give the answer that people will not give up when they on their on their side when, when their idea seems like they matter, right? But let's look at uh, the example of like presidential ele huh? elections or elections of I'll take it later, pol like um, parliament members, right? Their I their elections basically directly engage to who becomes the president, right? And yet people still do not care. We believe these people, as Bill, as Annie basically um, said, and Bill POI. They have a better like kind of motive. They want to obtain a family. They're busy working. They rather spend that time working and basically not know, and are very ignorant about these politics. They have to prove why these flyers and like um and campaigns will make people th that are unrelated to po politics actually care for it, right? We don't think we give they give that much of a mechanization, right? Which is which is a clear harm of this referenda, right? Okay, moving on to our extensions. On the um on the comparative on our side, most governments have a PR, which is a proportionate representation system, or an SMD, which is a single member oh, district si situation. I'll take it later. Sorry. And for legis and for legislature, we already have a minority's voice. It, for example, in UK, which is the most established democracy, they have a minority representation. Yeah, and we believe that this like is an example why our side we actually have minority like. Um, examples too, right? For example, the UKIP and the Scottish Party, which is a minority, still got a voice, and often win 
wins a lot of seats in the House of Commons, right? The same thing happens in Korea, while where like uh, during the thir 300 seats of like the uh, parliament, almost like 50 seats are, are like directly directed to these like minority members, right? But under a referendum, the minority's voice is neglected. For example, LGBTQ plus Muslims, people that are from other countries, right? These, if the min majority's opinion is uh, only considered as Kevin himself said, this means that like minority voices are farther mar marginalized. For example, LGBTQ plus, they do not get get rights for gay marriage and further discriminate it for the at the very least are and are the very least are marginalized. I'll take your POI right now. We clearly told you that the rich are have more incentivization and even are legal in the United States, the leading example of democracy. Is it in addition? Uh, sorry, speaker, I cannot hear you. Uh, yeah, you... Sorry. Uh, yeah, can, I think I can hear you now. Can you continue? We we clearly told you that the rich have more incentivization and are even and lobbying is even legal in the United States. Additionally, rich people care about their success more than their social image. So how can you ensure okay, that? Okay, I get it. Good? Okay. Basically, even if it's not illegal in some countries, in Korea, it is illegal. And it, in USA, it's probably socially condemned, right? Because of the fact that rich, rich people have more political power than the minority, right? And in the status quo, where we're cancel culture and people are woke, we believe this has a bigger of an impact, right? And we even if um, lobbying exists, we believe that the minority's voice being lost is a bigger harm. We, be, we believe we already have like talked about this, right? To our second argument about it, ex effectiveness, the premise is that even if it's not for populism and the harms to the minorities, and even if there's no backlash of referendums, we, th we think referendums are simply an inefficient way to make decisions. This directly clashes with Kevin's argument on efficiency, but even if we assume that they are clashed, it's better than A, being unfair, and secondly, being uninformed policies being passed. This is true because given the prop emphasizes on democracy, informed decisions are as mechanized uh, in the previous argument is crucial, right? We say these uh, this requ requires many resources and time to be properly implemented at the least of 33 days. And the opportunity cost from this is that a better country to devote more time and resources to so solve social issues like poverty or immigration policies, rather than spending lots of money to organize a national referendum all over the country, right? We believe the effectiveness is on our side, right? Now, moving on to our third argument, which is deepening um, social conflict, right? The referendum is usually done by a simple vote. The side majority is on is the side get, that gets chosen, right? There's no discussion. There's no nothing, right? This is problematic because, one, there will be severe polarization. Polarization, that means it means that there will be a case where no neutral solutions will be passed, and the decision will go to ideological extremes, right? This happens with referendums because of the fact that um, it it's, usually looks like, should we implement this policy or not? Should we leave things leave things as they were or, or should we change them? It asks whether or not we should do something, not something in the middle, right? It leads to this, uh, divisive campaigns and exacerbating social issues, taunting others so that, their, that uh, their side will get more popularity, right? We believe these kinds of political strategy is undermines the importance of social cohesion. But second, consensus. There, there is no consensus on their side because even if there's a one vote difference, the side with more votes wins. It doesn't uh, regard the minority because not many, uh, and since it didn't, don't regard the minority, not many citizens would be satisfied from the decision that leads from a referendum. So basically, even if the referendum is done, there will be more controversial issues being further ignited because people do not agree with them. There will be no negotiations and no more discussions, which is the reason why we're so proud to oppose. Thank you. The poor were blinded for centuries under the false facade of representation and misguided throughout their lives that the two parties that had no choice but to vote for was con chain that prevented you from representing your beliefs. Prop is proud to stand for a true representative democracy, very proud to propose. Do things I'm gonna do, do things I'm gonna do in his speech. Firstly, a comparison and nitpicks on their side about lobbying, if lobbying is prevalent or not. Secondly, on the comparative of why lobbying exists more on their side, thirdly on my two clashes, which side benefits minority, second which side benefits political efficiency and political effectiveness. Some nitpicks then, they say that lobbying condemned in society. Firstly, in a lot of those major government policy, it is not, it is literally a state that uh, lobbying is very essential in preventing the democratic system. So it's clear that it's not really condemned, at least by the government. Even if it is condemned by the society, I'm not sure why the corporations give any, any, any care about this, like, society insofar as
example, McDonald's or a lot of workers, those workers cannot care to like this McDonald's or whatever. Insofar as they're gonna get fired or they're literally disenfranchised. But thirdly, those corporations in the past and historically right now in the present do not care, and it is evident that they do not care about societal explanation for societal norms. But even if they do, they do under the falsification of improving what they actually first on the picks then. The first the pick is that they said a lobbying is not prevalent, is marginal and illegal or societally condemned in society. Three layers here. A, it is literally not legal. It is legal in the US and UK and US and UK hear public opinion saying that lobbying was an essential part of government. So at least the government does not condemn it. Two, even if it is societally condemned, I'm unsure why corporation give any, any care about what the society thinks. Insofar as they, they have been historically and present right now have shown little consideration for the people or the feedback they have given. Insofar as they literally, uh, insofar as they have a lot of societal economic power to either shut down those posts or just power through it because of name brand. Uh, secondly, then their point is that the rich is marginal and that only the 0.1 is controlling, so it, not, it must not be that much problem. This is an egregious assumption because the zero point elite control around 60% of the world's capital right now, when the a global poor, rather, even though it's like, like 75% or something, they control less than 10. What this means is that zero point one elite, even if it's a small number, the vast amount of financial capital they have, the vast amount of social economic status that they have, is enough to prove you that the elite is only going to benefit the, uh, the rich. This another analysis that came from Joseph that is really smart is that a lot of those people or a lot of these a lot of these corporations hold a lot of poor people in their status as well. By benefiting the rich people, the rich false uh, creates a false narrative that the poor are ben they're benefiting the, also the poor as well. And so far as if the poor do not vote, they risk getting fired from McDonald's, they risk getting fired from Amazon, things like that. So current parties start to only represent the rich in so far as corporations lobby to gain voting power. But even without lobbying, we told you even if analysis that in so far as the rich zero point elite control. 60% of the global world's capital. Parties, even without lobbying, has incented to give bias and invest their policy and benefit the rich in the first place. So that was all the analysis to prove you that clearly lobbying is prevalent, is not marginal, and is not really that much society condemned society. Then let's go on to the first clash. Who say benefits minorities? The contention, the contention here is that they say, well, there's a House of Commons, there's a Green Party, and minorities don't know much about politics, so therefore it's not really beneficial. Two, uh, two layers here. Firstly, notice how weak this response is. Never was the Green Party voted in. The House of Commons has 50 seats for the or or, the, or like the ordinary people, but they're they're outvoted by 150 other seats in Parliament right now. So I'm unclear why even if there is like a, a, a marginal amount of representation for society, I'm unsure why these minorities are benefited in so far as those uh those never succeed. What is the implication of this analysis, both given by Kevin and Joseph? What this means is that those poor, insofar as they know that historically, even if they vote for the Green Party, even if they vote for like the 50, the House of Commons, they're not gonna have much effect in this. So this leads to two outcomes here. Firstly, at least it, at least it, political apathiness ap apathy, where they do not really care about anything about politics, insofar as they're not gonna be voted in. Anyways, two, they vote for Democrats or Republicans and they resort to voting for the popular party that the rich lobby already is, meaning that on both sides, the poor do not benefit, the rich becomes richer and uh, uh, richer anyways. Notice this analysis under the point that lobbying doesn't exist. It was entirely dependent on the poor uh, psychological incentive. Secondly, then, what is the benefit? Uh, uh, proving that, secondly, what is the benefit? What is the competitor of this point? That minorities are the most vulnerable stakeholder in this way. Even if we get slower a referendum, even if referendum is ineffective, the fact that the people or the people under the poor get much more efficient, efficient efficiencies insofar as they at least get represented in the society rather than being neglected by historic disenfranchisement, this is a much better solvency at the end of the day, even disregarding our best case. But secondly, I'm going to prove why on my second clash, a website benefits efficiency. I'm going to prove you a referendum is very, very efficient in the uh, process. Before we go on to the slide, I'm going to note that society is developing. We also told you from the very top first, like, top, uh, first and framing Kevin's speech that uh, a society is being a much more technological dependent, dependent, which means that things like online balance or things like I don't know, online rep, online forums to talk about referendums are becoming increasingly more common in society. I'm, on, I'm sure as society develops, this technology will also increase as well. So I think it's at least I will willing to trade a bit of efficiency in so far as there's things like online forums, there's online voting system is such also I don't think efficiency is that much of a problem. Also, this motion sort of exists in the state that this is even possible in the first place. Otherwise, we don't even having this motion anyways. Three layers to the white RSA benefits, public efficiency and political effectiveness. Three layers. Firstly, those individuals who don't agree with the two bipolarized political parties, they're able to know and voice their opinion as in the past, they never had the representation considering the representatives of third party really impact, were not impactful anyway that like the Green Party was never voted in, in history. In that, 
in a representative democracy, in a democracy where it's voted by the two most powerful elites, it is either one of the two. It's either the Democrats or Republicans. That is to say, the 59 people who are either Democrats, but the, when the Republicans win, the 49% of the people who are Democrats are dissatisfied, they're angry, they do not have any voice when to follow the electoral rule of the Republicans. What this means is two things. Firstly, they have more chance for the Democrats to turn apathetic again, insofar as those Democrats are dissatisfied with the votes. But two, they, the conclusion is that they, the parties don't really improve in the first place. It's just that on their side, individuals vote anyways or just not vote at all. Both does not solve the problem. I'll leave the op with to choose between the both. Secondly, even if it is troublesome to hold a referendum, know the impact of this. Firstly, I prove that efficiency is possible, and even if efficiency is not, we're willing to trade for the mark for the benefit that the marginalized groups have. Two, that in a representative democracy, their side trades over efficiency for thousands of people disenfranchised and not have any voice in this. Thirdly, reporting a referendum is a cause, uh, is a cause or at least a way to express their thoughts. It's not the same as a representative democracy where there's two opinions. There are probably likely to be multiple opinions because that's the basis in referendum is based on that many people or the common people has the ability and the voice to vote out in parliament. The conclusion and the takeaway is this. The bill has to prove three things. First, why it's possible for the poor and the disadvantaged communities to rise up. Secondly, why their side is efficient and more efficient than ours. But thirdly, why their side is even effective at all for the 49% of the minorities. We're very proud to propose. The reason debate results are decided by representatives of the best debaters, the judges in this round, is because we realize that a referendum-like system where every observer and debaters vote on this debate will be a mess and lead to an inaccurate result. Thankfully, we have a representative system today, and today's result is clear. We take this grand final very proud to post. Two questions I would like to ask to solidify our win. First, how does referendums impact democracy? And second, how does this impact the vulnerable minorities? Firstly, in terms of democracy, Proposition Side tells you that equal representation can be done as any everyone can participate in referendums. Three things, three things here. One, we agree that equal representation is important, but we want to analyze the two premises of representation. A, that all or most of the citizens' voices are getting heard, and B, that there is a well-informed decision. If a decision is based on a biased or insufficient information that cannot be considered as an opinion of that individual or, or, or the circumstance in and of itself was unfair, then what did we prove to you based on these two premises? We flipped the opposition side points by proving to you how in most cases the voter tout voter turnout is low, even for presidential elections. Just imagine how lower it would be if there is no, a I... frequent referendum vote in the opposition's uh, proposition side of the world. But you also proved to you about why the poor gets less informed decisions. I'm going to talk more about this in the second question, but still we try to, we flip this point. But then the second thing that they tell us is regarding the mechanism as to how they have, how we have lobbying. Four layers of responses towards this lobbying point. A, lobbying is prohibited as our previous speakers mentioned in many of the established democracies like South Korea meaning that the mechanism of their case applies only to a narrow pool of countries. But B, even if lobbying happens in every single country, politicians still have an incentive to care for their citizens. They want to, what they want to be re-elected, meaning that they will have to show progress in the five-year term of the office if it is seen oh, yeah. to the public that they are only favoring the rich so much, only favoring the corporations and making legislations only for the corporations. It is unlikely for them to get re-elected. This works as a check and balance system for lobbying to not happen to the extent that prop, prop proposition characterizes. C, even if all the responses I just gave is nonsense, lobbying is symmetric on both roads. Lobbying often creates legal loopholes rather than making a major government decision. This is true since the citizens and media are aware of the corporate power, aware of lobbying, and wants to prevent it. Now, right now, the wealthy will rather choose sneaky ways to make laws for their own benefits, such as have, having certain tax clauses for tax evasion. And this sort of loopholes are still created by representatives in the opposition side roles. Then the wealthy's power is symmetric because corporations exist in the opposition size world as well. And insofar as a proposition size policy only impacts the major government policies, blocking lobby will be impossible because there are other sort of right. minor government policies that these lobbying will affect as well. Final point of response towards this lobbying, and I'll take you after this, is that let's take opposition's absolute best and way. Corporations do indeed have incentive to at least want to keep a sustainable economy insofar as corporations profit from the economy. This is to say that they will have research and analysis to decide on what sort of lobbying is more effective in both benefiting the company while not screwing up the society. The comparative here in this debate, what will happen in proposition-sized world is where individuals who do not have 
as much resources as rich corporations will not be able to make comprehensive decisions that may benefit the society. Rather, they will have selfish incentives, especially if they are poor or marginalized. They want to escape the current situation the most because of the desperate nature of their situation. And therefore, the decision will not, be, will not best benefit the general society. This connects to the next question of minorities as well, the impacts on the minorities. But I'm going to deal with that a little bit later. And before anything, yes, I'll take your peel on. Who cares more and is impacted by healthcare, therefore being more knowledgeable, the poor or the rich? Just because you're impacted more by something does not mean that you have more knowledge for that. The poor may be impacted more by the healthcare, but then their incentive is clear. They want the maximum healthcare as possible. So what are they going to vote for? They're going to vote for more healthcare, but they will not consider the consequences of that vote, such as having to spend so much tax money for that so much government revenue that leading to some other backlashes, take, having to take away a lot of taxes. All these kind of backlashes are economic effects that poor cannot simply think of. And that is the reason why we say there should be representatives who can make a very more more comprehensive decision to better the society in general. And before moving on to the second question, finally, final point on polarization that they give us. We say that polarization is symmetric on both worlds insofar because even if there's referendums, there still will be political parties who persuade the citizens to vote in a certain way. There still will be politicians like Donald Trump to persuade and make speeches about how they should vote in referendums. This is to say that there will still be a division between the Republicans and Democrats. It is not likely that suddenly people will all turn in the opinions of the Green Party or whatsoever. Second question then, how does this referendum impact the vulnerable minority? Two points that we gave you. Firstly, we told you that the poor lack time and resources to make informed decisions. That is, they are busy making a living, at least comparatively to the rich. The impact of this was that most of the voter turnout will be the wealthy who can afford the voting resources and stuff. But secondly, even if the poor can vote, their decisions will not accurately, accurately reflect their needs as the poor lack the resources. That is, information such as news, understanding of economic concepts and more. This response to John QI as well. Kevin says that the poor already knows what the th what things like healthcare is, and it is in their best incentive to care for that. However, a one-dimensional understanding of healthcare where these kind of policies is insufficient, we need a more comprehensive understanding, and we see that the poor cannot simply afford to have those kind of things insofar as they lack, lack time and resources. Joseph responds to my POI that the poor is less likely to know about things in our world. Exactly the point. Since the poor cannot invest time to make decisions that most benefits them, we have representatives on comparative to make the decisions for the poor. The poor once in four or five, five years choose what sort of policy they want from politicians. And those politicians that the poor elect reflects the need of the poor. Oppositions, a pro, op, proposition side makes the poor to not be able to make well-informed decisions. The second thing we told you about this was regarding populism, how referendum votes are decided by a majority rule system. This is to say the majority will make decisions and minority voices will be stripped away. And this is worse, much worse in proposition side of the world because populism cause is the voting system of majority rules. This is not to say that we do not want any majority rule system. Representatives can be elected in this way, but for opposition side cases where voting is so frequent, it is more likely for them, for people to be blinded by the short-term effects and benefit, try to vote for their personal benefits, which means that it will only reflect the majority's needs. The weighing here is one in terms of vulnerability. As both teams concede that minorities are the most vulnerable stakeholders, we flip the proposition side point by populism. But secondly, on the short-term, long-term impacts, when those people who, are, who do not properly understand the consequences of their vote, vote in the long-term, all policies will be tailored towards the majority's needs, oppressing minority opinions and pro providing backlashes. And all in all, representative democracy on our world only enables proper democratic, is the only thing that enables proper democratic values to stand. I answered all of Sean's question, and therefore I'm never more, never the more part, proud to oppose. So the issue I have side proposition is that the entire case is contingent on political lobbying and how that somehow leads to a lack of voices for the majority on for the majority on our side. Considering that all three speakers literally gave you responses to this point, I think it's more than clear that we take this debate. So proud to propose. But with that, I'll do three things here. First, clarify some points and to tell you the metric for that this debate is one. And lastly, move on to two issues in this debate. First, on the voice of people and a uniformed decision being made. But first, let's move on to some clarifications. So the proposition totally ignored a key part of our model. Let me re reiterate. First, we prefer sticking to representative democracy where elected officials are are based on the BF on the BF of citizens like status quo. But we also added that if there's a situation where doing the public opinion is necessary, we will have public sites rather than referendums, which is a non-binding referendum. But this is a second, but this it's basically the second part pop part that prop totally failed to hear in my speech. We said that if there's such obvious a situation when it's necessary, we'll have a public site, which is obviously which is uh in this proof this uh, we already gave you that this is possible because it was used in Greece in the past. And I think this deals, deals with a lot of 
proposition's point on like how they exclusively have the voice of people. You know, while Sean told you that the House of Commons has like does not have like minority representation, we think it is better than your side because we at least have some kind of minority representation. She still gave you examples of like UKIP and the Scottish National Party having power under the US UK Parliament under the SMD system. On your side, on the other you have no minority representation whatsoever. The metric for this debate is under this proposition metric of which side has a better democracy. So first, let's go into the first issue of the voice of people. Proposition's really main and only point was that was on political lobbying, but apparently, like we all three of our speakers, like gave you analysis, but apparently Joseph didn't really listen to my speech because I gave you three rebuttals to political lobbying. But to reiterate, I gave you two responses. First, it's not likely as the majority wins, and it's not like the one percent rich, but they'll have all the political power. And it's also about the majority, i.e. the middle class vote. But even if we accept that there is a political lobbying, this is largely mitigatory thing that probably failed to impact this government in so far that it distorts the essence of democracy. But to our policy on a purpose that deals with this issue, because citizens' voice still goes on our side. I mean, think in terms of voice, we have it better because despite lobbying, politi politicians still have an incentive to better the society for all in, for all, in order to be re-elected in the next election under a representative democracy. Jisoo also gave responded to this, telling you that it is condemned to engage in political lobbying and rich people as they're and they're thus therefore not likely to lobby to the image and cancel culture. And Kevin asked in a POI that rich people to care about success, but if you care about success, that success actually comes from social image. So they wouldn't lobby on, on so it's unlikely that they would lobby, right? Moreover, both Joseph and um Dean Sean repeat that political lobbying is legalized, but that does not mean that it is supported by the people. For example, smoking is legal, but it is still condemned. We think that this is the same case. We also responded to this, saying that first, most politicians have an incentive to care for the citizens because they want to be reelected. But to, even if this is not the case, lobbying is symmetrical, symmetrical because lobbying usually happens to craft a political loop, 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 loophole and does not directly engage with big governmental decisions. And we, we clearly said that lobbying is not much of a problem, but even if it was a problem, the only problem with re representative democracy that the other team said is that is lobbying. And we prove multiple harms of referendums, such as the harm of, of majority rule systems. So in terms of magnitude, we take it. But they talk about increased voter turnout. Sean's intro about like how the poor are marginal classes is their first argument that they actually never respond to. And this actually deals with this point. I literally told you because the poor, even if we assume that they have some knowledge about politics, are not going to be dive as to able to dive in deep as politics as like the rich and middle class and therefore are likely to be marginal marginalized, right? I told you that because they're poor, they cannot afford to engage and devote their time into policy. So policies like social welfare was, is neglected. So we think there's a tangible harm for a uh, for minorities on your side. But to in the case of like little minorities, like sexual minorities or, or like my or like uh, ethnic minorities. We told you, we told you that the, on your side, on the referendum, minority opinions are neglected. So obviously like maybe non-allies or non-LGBTQ plus community members will oppose, oppose to like gay merge, which is the majority. So we think there's further, further margin, marginalization of the minority. But also we told you that under a majority opinion, only being included is things like policies for like foreigners, like immigration is denied. And we told you how this is so crucial in the top of my speech and at the end of the day we still got no response from time population whatsoever thus our on our side not only do we prove that we have better major majority opinions and accountable accountable voting at the end of the day a world where minorities are ignored is not a real democracy so proud to oppose darkness continues in areas where light is absent their side doesn't solve this because they shine light in the wrong area if they don't realize that it is politicians that divert away from helping constituents who prioritize financial gain that the very idea that the nature of a representative democracy leads to inefficiency the problem with the representative democracy was that low voting rates our side solution was direct democracies which provided these distinct solutions to this debate one i was holistic analyze this debate as a whole and second allies to the what like winning path two side push to a final comparative eight weighing as to why ours was better. First of all, let's just holistically analyze this debate. Their entire case operated with the neglect of nature of representative uh like of democracy, right? I think first is this to say that note the host of characterizations we gave to you about politicians' innate tendency to be individual centered and profit motivated. The very idea that poor will be uneducated compared to the rich on both sides was clear, whereas our side gave you analysis as to why at least our side includes them. At least our side tells them that they're important and that they're affected by this. There's as uneducated poor people will not know that the politicians ran away with their votes and didn't even correctly represent them. There is as uneducated poor people will not see policies actively being enacted on their side of the house. But second, the only winning path that narrowed down and remained on their side was one thing. And that was poor people that are unengaged, thus they will make short-termist policies, and it was that claim. To re-clarify what happened repeated as a rebuttal and re like preempt of like clarification from the top of Kevin's speech was the very idea that the difference we make on educated poor people were that 
their active uh, uneducated poor people, where uh, their active participation, their accumulating experience in the electoral process, them debating with the common people is what changes the rate of participation. It is what changes their knowledge in the political field and presence in the political field. Their side acknowledges the problem of the uneducated poor, but we're yet to hear a solution. Their solution is to keep them this way at best. A few points of contentions we made that were unengaged to, I think it was mainly four things. First of all, we told you that the votes of elected officials in a representative democracy do not always reflect the will of the people or accurately reflect the ideas of the people. We told you that the officials really don't have any incentive or are, aren't bound by any legal like frameworks to vote the way people who elected them like want them to vote, like wanted them to vote, right? But second of all, we told you on the point of inefficiency, we told you that because governments are shaped by representative democracy on their side of the house, you're obviously going to Developed to bureaucracies, which are obviously known to be extremely slow, as we told you, in terms of arguments and whatnot that are going to happen and that are going to slow down, and especially in a lot of the urgent situations that this debate is happening upon. But also, we told you a huge point on corruption and lobbying. We told you that candidates, but also a lot of rich people, misrepresent their stances on issues or like policy goals, obviously, in order to achieve political power. We told you that not only is there an incentive from politicians to act in terms of personal financial gain rather than actually like representing and correctly, uh, accurately representing representing the people that they're supposed to represent, but also the fact that lobbying happened in a lot of instances. I think the killer point on this is this. The debate was between a side that was pushing for a lot of lobbying versus a little lobbying. Sure, their side has some parties that are profit incentivized and that let's say like, you know, some, like not a lot of parties lobby on their side of the house, but it still doesn't matter. Our side does not have any type of lobbying whatsoever because we got up, out, we basically rooted out the entire factor of politicians like being the middleman and like and trying to keep a lot of these people from actually re like uh, uh, reaching their voice and to actually getting their voice out to the government and to actually enact change, right? It was, uh, it was, this is this is the basically the biggest point that made the difference. There is a whip speech of Greta at best is a symmetrical factor. If you claim to co-op all the benefits of referendums, what is the basis of reason that you don't think these decisions should be decided to referendum? If the collectively agreeable point in this debate is that a representative democracy, any type of democracy, should be a government that is created by the people and for the people, it ultimately depends on the people's freedom and the people's flexibility to express their voice to the government without the obstacle of representatives, without the obstacle of like rich people and the majority uh, and the, basically the power majority that really don't represent people accurately or nor ethically because on this basis we're very proud to uh propose